Okay, I'm afraid we need to move on. Thanks, Mike, very much for a stimulating talk. Okay, so next talk will be given by Phaedra Upton from uh, GNS New Zealand, and we'll be hearing about the Kaikoura earthquake. Okay, um, thank you, Greg, and um, it's great to be back in Boulder again. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about the Kaikoura earthquake. This um, occurred about 18 months ago, um, on the 14th of November, um, 2006. Uh, it was magnitude 7.8. It was felt through most of central New Zealand, um, more intensely by some than others. I have to admit, it woke me up. I thought, yeah, it's not a bad earthquake, and I went back to sleep. Um, my colleagues got up, raced to work. So yeah, when my friend called, called, called me at seven o'clock the next morning, I realized I raced to work too. Um, and I ended up doing some GPS field work after, uh, for the next several days. But today I'm gonna to talk about, um, well, I'll give you an introduction to the earthquake and then I'll talk about the landslides, the landsliding response, and what we've learned in the 18 months since then. Um, this landslide I think is the one that Michael just showed on the um, amazing satellite data. Um, so we were really lucky. This earthquake happened at four minutes past midnight. Um, so there was there were two cat two deaths, um, both in houses. So damaged hit by um, falling stuff in their houses. Uh, about fifty or sixty injuries. There was one train driver who was stuck in his train overnight between two slips. Kind of been much fun. So I'll just give you a really quick introduction to the tectonic setting. Why this earthquake happened. Um, so New Zealand is situated on a plate boundary between the Australian and Pacific plates. The plate boundary runs off to the east of the North Island and along the Alpine Fault um, on the West and South Island. And this earthquake happened in between those two, right in here, which is um, Marlborough Fault System. There's a series of parallel strikes of faults that are taking up most of the, most of the plate motion. Uh, this is one of the faults along here, the Awat Tree Fault, um, which early in its history had a lot of uplift and it's now largely strike slip. So the earthquake, the earthquake in some ways it was unexpected in that, you know, we've been focused on the Alpine Fault for so long, the Hikarangi subduction zone. These are two big, big plate boundary faults. Then Christchurch, Darfield and Christchurch occurred, which occurred on faults that we weren't really aware of. And then bam, another one um, on a fault that we weren't, it, it's, this is the seismic hazard model. So it's obviously a region that's, that we know was, was high probability of, of a large earthquake. But as I said, it wasn't one of the two major faults. Uh, the Hikarangi seems to have disappeared. Um, so a large earthquake there was an unexpected, but it was a very usual, unusual event. And one of the things was that it wasn't, the faults that we would have expected to rupture in that region, in particular the Hope Fault, which is one of the Marlborough faults, it's the most active of the Marlborough faults, it didn't rupture at all. Instead, a series of faults to the south of it, southeast of it ruptured, and then as they propagated north, they did it, the rupture did move on to faults that, that we knew were very active. So here's a map of what we've learned in the last 18 months. So the earthquake. The epicenter was down here in North Canterbury, and in the red are all the faults that we know ruptured as part of that earthquake. So it started down here, propagated to the north. We've mapped a few offshore, and then came up through here, um, up towards Wellington. So it was a 7.8. The shaking lasted two to three minutes, depending on when you were there. There are multiple effects on the landscape. About 180 kilometers of surface rupture, up to 12 meter offsets on some of the faults. Um, that strike slip up to nine meters of vertical on the puppeteer, which was again what Michael showed in the satellite, and I've got some photos of that. There was a large part of the coast was uplifted, and because it's so complicated, it was it was variable how much uplift. There were locally there were some tsunamis, and 
tens of thousands of landslides and also many landslide dams because, of course, this area is really quite mountainous. Um, and liquefaction was locally significant, but nothing like what we've experienced in Christchurch. So here's a couple of um, examples of what it looked like on the ground. This is where the puppeteer fault that Michael showed on the satellite image comes out to the, um, the coast. It actually comes out as two strands. That's why Papa Bay, and this, this, here was, this area here was a pop-up of about six metres see the road and the railway. So that's just looking down the railway there. That's looking at the road and the railway from the air. This is one of the faults down um, South Canterbury near the epicenter. And this, this here is Bluff Station and Greg and others have, have been, have know the landowners here and have been here. And Bluff Station is on the Kekarengu Fault, which had not quite, not here, but further north had um, 13 metres of offset. But here, this house, oops, have I done? Yes, that's what I want. So this house was right on the fault, and you can see how much offset on the driveway. And this had, there's a lot of stories. I could spend my whole time telling stories, but this is a, this is a good story. So the, the um, farm worker was in that cottage, and because the earthquake started to the south, and so he was woken up by the shaking. He got out of the house, and then 30, 40 seconds later, the fault ruptured right through his house, and that's the offset. Um, that's his house. It, the fault right through it, it moved it, it moved it off its foundations by about eight metres. It's a wooden house. And you see the windows aren't even broken. So, you know, wood is, wood's good. <sighs> this is the puppeteer fault. So this is, as I said, that satellite image, this was the uplifted side, this is the downside. So it crosses the Clarence River coming through here. It, it comes along here. There's a farm track we went down that, the, you know, you stood at one end of the farm track and you looked down about six metres and the, the owners were saying this was flat. And it was hard to believe except, you know, we knew. So, yeah, there's approximately eight metres of strike slip here and about six metres of offset. It crosses the Clarence River in a couple of places. Um, this ended up uplifting the, down uplifting the downstream side, so we got a hauling. And down here, it created a, a new rapid on the Clarence River. Um, that has since, I'm afraid that as far as I know, we haven't been tracking that net point. We've been quite busy, but um, that has cut back. It's in soft rock and it's cut back really quickly. So as I said, yeah, there was um, coastal, up, the coast um, uplifted and, and went down. So high amounts of uplift here, some subsidence here, um, you can see really dramatic uplifts along the coast, the seaweed lines gave it. So there was, you know, in the week, couple of weeks after, it, it, there was just heaps of work happening to try and track all this. Things like this, seaweed and that were time dependent. We had to get in there and map them. Um, where there was local tsunami, but because one, it was low tide, and two, the mud of the coast went up rather than down, the, the potential tsunami was a lot less than it, than it could have been. This is, um, the permanent ground movement that we've measured in the last year since the earthquake, the scale bar is one metre. So this area here moved about six metres um, closer to Christchurch. And, and you, it's just really complicated, which is because of all those multiple faults. So moving on to landslides, the topic of this talk, it was immediately obvious that landslides were going to be a major issue. Um, that first day after the earthquake, there were many recurrence, reconnaissance flights. The um, earthquake geologists managed to get on flights with the media as soon as it was light. And so, yeah, so lots of landslides. Um, but there was, there was concern about the potential for the road access, the rail access, and landslide dams. Um, 
and it was wet. A couple of days after the earthquake, it really poured with rain. So that was, again, a real concern for breaching of landslide dams. Um, and so there are a couple of groups, one out of Durham, Tom Robinson, another out of the USGS. These are the ones I know about, possibly, probably others, working with colleagues in New Zealand that were trying to model the landslides in real time to see if we could, you know, before we could actually go and map everything to see if we could actually get a re re realistic idea of, of how many, of where the landslides were. This map here is um, from Tom's paper, um, but it's, it's the result of months and months of work, so it's not. So it shows the shaking intensity, um, the epicenter was down here, the, the energy propagated to the north, um, so there's all map, mapped landslides and um, road blockages um, and, and landslide dams in, in the mountains. So there's two papers that have just come out. There's a special issue of, the, of BSSA um, on the Kaikoura earthquake that's just come out. So there's two papers that describe this, this near real-time modelling of landslides. So what they did during the days after the earthquake and how successful it was. So I'll just talk about um, this, this Robinson et al, what their, their work. Um, this, is, this is one of the many landslides. We actually saw this one as we were flying over to do GPS work. Um, this is just an aside. There's the railway line coming into the landslide. And there's the railway line having been pushed out by, by the landslider because it should be there. So it's actually been pushed out. So this is the Durham work. They they built a, they had a model um, 21 hours after the earthquake. They based it on the USGS shake map. So they had an intensity from from that early early model. They modeled the likely, likelihood of landslides, and from that where you're likely to get road blockages, and where you are likely to have landslide dams. And then once they got once the GNS the GNS shake map was, was developed about 20, uh, 72 hours after the earthquake, they built another model. Um, so with a more detailed shake map, uh, yeah, shake map, and again, the likelihood of lands, landslides and the road and river blockages. We knew by this time, we knew on Monday morning that Kaikoura was completely, completely blocked off. There was, so the, the main road comes south along the coast to Kaikoura, and then go south along the coast and then out into the mountains. And there was, I think, 30 major landslides between north and south of Kaikoura. There's another inland road, and that was also blocked by landsliding. The railway, because it runs along the road, was also completely blocked. So the residents of Kaikoura was, there was emergency helicopter um, for anyone that needed it. And then within a few days, the Navy frigate had gone in. And so people that wanted to leave could leave. Um, but it wasn't, there was no road open for at least a month. And then that was just an inland road that was open part of the day. There were convoys. Um, so yeah, it was, it was blocked off for a long time. So um, following the, their, their initial models, and once we had a much better idea of the actual distribution of landslides, this is kind of the, the, what they got from their modelling. Well, they obviously highlighted that landsliding would be widespread, which we expected, um, that the, the Kaikoura was likely to be cut off as it was. And, and these results were used by the first responders to try and figure out where they needed to go and look and, and where they might need to go and find people. Um, verification showed that while the models captured a large um, percentage of the, of the landslides that occurred, they overestimated, and all the models overestimated the number of landslides and where they were going to be. Um, so, yeah, so obviously we need some to modify the models and, and automate if, we're going to, if these are going to be useful tools in, in a future event. So a year after the earthquake, what can we say about what, was, what did control landsliding? Um, and it turns out to be geology in relationship to faults. So there's three main rock types in this area. There's quaternary gravels, sands and silts, which are um, 
forming terrace deposits and, and alluvial fans. There's um, the, the red uh, ne neogen sedimentary rocks that tend to be um, the sandstones, limestones. This is, this is the Puppeteer Fault between the, and, and there's the basement tallest, so most of the green is this basement grey wacky that was laid down at the Mesozoic. Um, so this Puppeteer Fault, which was one of the most, had the most dramatic offsets on, that, that we've looked at, that was mapped as an inactive fault because there was no, we had, there was no evidence that it was active and it, it was mapped as a boundary between these two units, as we know now by an active fault. And there's a lot of work being done to, to now go back and look at the paleoseismicity of these faults. So the landslides tended to be in these neogen sedimentary rocks like this one here. This is the, the um, this is a limestone and, and it sort of um, flowed down through here. And, and then in, in the grey wackies. And we either, there was lots of slumps, lots of rock slides, and there was some big, big rock falls, big landslides. Um, a lot on the coast, as we've seen, there's the main road and the railway. Um, so there were, yeah, as I said, there were about 30 or so of these big, big landslides. Um, it took 10 months to reopen the railway. It was reopened to freight only. And also they really, they worked really hard to get that open first because that facilitated working on the road. The road was open with several big one-way sections, but it was open like the 22nd of December. So it was open in time for Christmas traffic, uh, 13 months after the earthquake. And it turned out that a lot of the, that proximity to faults was a really significant um, feature for, for landsliding. So this is just a plot of the number of landslides versus distance from fault and in, in meters. And so a lot of them were right at the fault zone. Um, this is the seaward landslide. This is on the Puppeteer Fault. So there's the fault trace coming through and that's where the landslide has been triggered. So as I said, there are some very big landslides. This was the largest one, the Hapoku up on the mountains. That's a source area here. Um, these both post earthquake images. Again, fault running through the source area for the landslide and this is where and this this formed one of the biggest landslide dams that people that in the early days was one of the most concerning to um, the civil defense etc um, in the end it's it was relatively stable for quite a while so this was in the gray wacky large source area and it, it as I said it dammed the Hapoka River with a large um, a large landslide dam like in the back there. Um, this is another large landslide. This is the leader slump. This is in the, the neogen sediments. Um, again, big, big slump, big lake in the back. This, it, um, it completely dammed the river and there was no flow through here for about, eight, not until May, I think. Um, and then it, it, it broke through. Um, once it got a bit wetter in the winter. And again, it's not shown on this map. I think it's shown on the next slide. Again, there's a, there's a fault, the leader fault. In this case, it's actually at the base of the landslide rather than at the top. So there's, there's, there's um, you know, is it, it's probably a combination of the close proximity to shaking and also the fault, the damage zones of the fault, so weakening the rock. That meant that these two, that, that the fault proximity it was always a real risk factor for, for these large landslides. So after the yeah, so after the earthquake, we've got lots of landslides, landslide dam, um, lots of loosened material up on the hills, and since then we've had four X cyclones come through. So in two thousand seven, we had cyclone Cook and then cyclone Debbie. Well, I think they were X by the time they got to us. Um, so a lot of concern about what what these landslides and debris flows were going to do, and ind indeed we did have. So um, the, the the rain from this event actually caused the Hapoku Dam to overtop and start to er erode down, um, but it wasn't a it wasn't a dam burst, so it wasn't a dramatic. It didn't um, 
endanger anything downstream, but it, it has started that the erosion of, of that feature. And lots of material from the coastline from these landslides was remobilized. So here's the rebuilt road with debris on top of it. That's a puppeteer, that's a trace of the puppeteer fault coming through there and another place where the um, the road was blocked. And again, in um, this year, a few months ago, this was ex cyclone Gita, and um, it was tracking uh, west of New Zealand, and so they weren't really sure where it was going to go. In fact, Wellington had a huge, there was, you know, big heavy rain warnings for Wellington, but it actually ended up kind of splitting, and it went north of Wellington, and, and then it, and it basically tracked right over Kaikoura, which is unfortunate. So it was, rainfall was highly localised on the coast. Kaikoura got 270 mil in 12 hours, um, and huge, again, a large amount of debris ended up on the road. So it, the, the road was closed for over a week, and, and most of this, of course, occurred on slopes that were, had been damaged by the earthquake. I need to speed up. Um, and this, so this is pre gita post gita scar on the landscape. Doesn't even look like that one impacted the road post earthquake. But this is this is a, it's a slightly different angle. But um, that there is that flat there, and you can see heaps of that material got got mobilised by this event and down onto the road. And there's still a lot of material up there. So. That, that kind of brings us to one of, you know, the ongoing hazard from this earthquake is the sediment cascade. This transport of all this material that has been loosened and, and de well, either deposited at the base of a landslide or loosened on the hill slopes is going to get transported to the sea over the next, well, we don't know, years to decades. Um, and it w and that these, these pictures are from Wenxuan, so showing pre-earthquake, so pre-10 years ago, all the landsliding that occurred as a result of the earthquake and then how it's been transported downslope and into the river system there. And in our case, it's largely being transported to the coastal plain across our State Highway 1. Um, and we expect that these hazards will last for years or, or possibly decades in cases. So there's a huge amount of monitoring and modelling and work being done um, we've got a large project to, to, to look at these landslides, to understand the landslides, understand their, the, the mechanics of why they occurred, but also what's going to happen to monitor and understand what's going to happen over the next, the next years. Um, so it involves a lot of LIDAR, structure promotion, field work, monitoring the rainfall, trying to look at the um, relationship between rainfall and, and movement of material. Uh, numerical modelling and lot and of course working with the communities and the stakeholders and the regional councils of transit um, and everybody else. So um, we're going to be using Eros, which is a bed load um, model to move material around that is about has been developed at University of Wren. Um, there's a website there, or if you're interested, you can ask me. Um, so we can move bed load. We can erode the banks and, and look at this um, look at the sediment transport downslope. And one of the reasons that we chose it is because it, it's been calibrated against a, an early event from New Zealand, the Mount Adams landslide, so a large landslide that occurred in the 80s. This wasn't earthquake, it just happened. Um, it dammed the Korora River and then there was an outburst flood um, with the next big rainfall. And, and so this sediment has been moving down the river system for the last 30 years and there's been, it's been monitored really closely. And so um, Tomas um, did his PhD on modeling this and, and calibrating Eros to, to this natural example here. And um, in our breakout yesterday, there was a, one of the things that was raised is something we need to do is to develop tools that that the stakeholders can use. And that's definitely one of the planned outcomes from this project is that we can end up with some, some sort of tool that we can give to, we can either use with or give to, depends on how that turns out, to, but to the councils and the people that, in, that are dealing with the infrastructure in the downstream area. Um, 
so you know you can run ensemble models and work out the probability of, of so this is for Pyrrhua probability of flooding and probability of, of where you're going to get um, the alluvial material flowing down. Ooh, okay, so I'm rather than summarize, I'm going to point out why this is super important to us. It's important to, well, other places, I mean, Taiwan, Wingshan, everybody has this. But we also have the Alpine Fault. And the, Alpine, the latest um, paleo seismic study for the Alpine Fault suggests that there's a greater than 50% chance of a magnitude 8 in the next 50 years. The, the last event on the Alpine Fault was pre-European history, but it's dated very accurately with tree rings to 1717. We had a 300-year anniversary conference last year, which turned into a Kaikoura conference. But um, So yeah, the last event was 301 years ago. Um, we have a, a record going back 8,000 years in places, um, a combination of bond fault studies and lake studies and um, wetlands. This is just an, this is just going back to um, 500 years BC um, along the fault, and these are the previous events. So with with mapping these lakes and and these other marshes, we can really we've got a really good idea of the um, how often this fault ruptures, how often it ruptures and make a couple of, you know, whether it ruptures the whole 400 kilometers, how often it does that. Um, so it's definitely time that, that we really thought about what we're gonna have to do. Um, the lakes also give us the sedimentary response to the event. The Alpine Fault is right along the edge of the mountains. So these lakes, what, we, what they see is when they see a shaking deposit, then they see a post, seismic layer, which is, is the, all the landslide material, which is high organic, so it's you know, the trees and stuff, and then um, the aseismic period. This period for the Alpine Fault, so when that sediment response lasts 40 to 60 years on average, I think that's more than Kaikoura is gonna be, it's, it's gonna be a big event. And about 40% of the sedimentation happens during that time. So that's why we, we are going to use Kaikoura as, as learn as much as we can from it. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, Phaedra. Questions for Phaedra? You um, mentioned that the models had overpredicted the slides. And I was wondering if you could follow up with a little bit more detail on that. I figure a crustal fault of that magnitude with that much oblique slip in the, the wheat bix of New Zealand would be a great landslide generator. So what's the nature of the model that you were referring to? So that was like the, um, that was statistical models. And well, I'm not an expert in those, but um, they, they were, I would have to, I refer you to, to Robinson and Al and the other papers, but they were just purely based on the shaking magnitude and the slope. And so they, there was no geology in there. There was no idea that the proximity to the faulting made it landslides more likely. So those initial models predicted over 100,000 landslides, whereas we've, I think it's like 20 or 30,000. So yeah, we, there's, there was heaps of landsliding, but it just wasn't as extreme as those particular models predicted. Thanks for the talk, that was fun. Um, you mentioned that they did a little bit of offshore mapping to look at uh, displacement offshore as well. Yeah. Did they have enough um, pre-earthquake bathymetry to look at possible offshore uh, landslides? They had a wee bit, so it was a real fluke that there, one of the research vessels was offshore North Island at the time, and so they came down about a week after and, and did some mapping. Um, they they had enough that they knew where the faults were, and, and in the Kaikoura Canyon, they did have pre and post, and I think that's been published, and if you come and talk to me, I can find it for you. So 
they did see a large, large, so the edge of the canyon failed and they could track that down. And they sampled the turbidite from that in that cruise. Which is really cool. Terrific. Let's thank uh, Fedra one more time. Thank you.